I think that to live our very best life with multiple sclerosis, we need to be five for five. Yes, we need to take a DMT and make sure it's working. Yes, I don't want you smoking stuff. And yes, I want you to be exercising as part of your lifestyle. And yes, we need to make sure that we're supplementing vitamin D. But number five is not to be underappreciated. Howdy, everyone. I wanted to talk to you about being five for five. Some of you are very familiar with my concepts of being four for four, and I wanted to expand upon it today. When I think about how to live your best life despite having MS, there are four things that have been top of mind for years now. And so I developed this saying, I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. And I know you guys know that I'm a super big nerd, but there's a reason that my clinic phone number is 3043444. It's because I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. So yes, I am that nerd. And these four things are an easy way to remember four things that you can be doing to up your game and live your best life. So I've recently added a fifth one, but let's go through the first four and then we'll jump into that fifth one together. So the first one that I wanna talk about is not smoking stuff. And if you're a smoker, I'm not picking on you. Uh, you're an adult, you're allowed to do whatever you want. But the reality is that if you smoke, it doubles the risk to develop MS. And if you already have MS, it increases the speed of progression by about 50%, which is a very high number. And so quitting smoking is arguably the single most impactful thing that you can do to improve your disease. It's easy to say don't smoke, but if you're a smoker, it's very, very hard to quit. And so I spend a lot of time and energy making sure that people know if you want help, I want to help you. Now, I'm not naive, and until you're ready to quit, me talking at you is actually not very useful, and there's data to support that. People, when they quit smoking, go through several phases. They go through the pre-contemplative phase, which is a very polite way of saying, no, uh, talk to the hand, I'm not quitting. And then sometimes you shift from the pre-contemplative phase into the contemplative phase, and that means I'll smoke a cigarette while listening to you. So I'll listen to what you have to say and I'll contemplate it. I'm not quitting yet, but I'm thinking about it. And that's where I really want to help folks out in that stage. Then you move to the quitting stage where you're actively trying not to smoke. And then the hard part comes in when you have to maintain that. And I've made several YouTube videos on tricks and tips to help quit smoking. Um, I'm going to share one now, uh, and, and this is a pro tip that I was taught, and it's uh, helped a lot of people prepare to quit smoking. So long before you quit smoking, I need you to do one important tool. You need to identify the key cigarette, right? And everybody that smokes has a couple key cigarettes. And one of the most common key cigarettes is the when I wake up cigarette. So a lot of smokers will tell you they're going to wake up and they're going to have a cigarette, maybe a cup of coffee. And until they do that, don't talk to them because they may murder you. All right. That cigarette has a tremendous amount of emotional value. It's an important emotional cigarette. That's how they initiate their day. So what I want a smoker to think about doing is not to quit that cigarette. No, 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 no. Don't quit it. Delay it. So you wake up in the morning and you get your pack of cigarettes out and you pull out the cigarette and you smell it, it smells awesome. And you look at it, it looks awesome. And then you set it down on the kitchen table and you say, I will smoke you in an hour. Set a timer and walk away. Now during the hour, you can visit the cigarette as much as you want. You can touch it, you can smell it, you can hold it in your hand, just can't light it. Because what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to decouple the emotional value of the cigarette from the nicotine delivery. Oftentimes what smokers tell me is they'll start off with 20 cigarettes a day, a full pack, and they'll get down to half a pack. They're pretty excited. They get down to five cigarettes. They're very excited. Somewhere between one and five, they can't keep going and they, they finally start to smoke more. That's because they got rid of the easy cigarettes first and they got down to just the hard ones. So I want you to flip that upside down. And before you start to quit, I want you to delay those key cigarettes for an hour. Teach yourself that you can do that. If you do that, when you go to quit later, it's going to work much better. Now, when we talk about being five for five, and the first one is not smoking, that's actually just the tip of the iceberg for the first one. The reality is that any unchecked cardiovascular risk factor drives MS disability faster. Now, think about what I just said. If you have uncontrolled diabetes with MS, 
your MS is going to get worse faster than if you had controlled diabetes. If you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, so you have high blood pressure and it's not being adequately managed with medicines or what have you, then you risk a faster disease progression. That's a really, really big deal. So hypertensive folks with MS get more disabled than folks that are not hypertensive. The same thing is true for inactivity and morbid obesity. The same thing is true for high cholesterol. And so if you have some cardiovascular risk factors, you should have them treated one, because it'll make you live longer because your heart's super important, but two, you should get them treated because it will actually slow your neurological disability. And the reason is interesting. MS untreated makes your brain age faster. So it makes your brain age faster and it wears out quicker. And if you have hardening of the arteries of your brain because of hypertension or diabetes or smoking, it also, for a different reason, makes your brain age faster and get smaller faster. And so if you have both things driving it, then you have accelerated brain volume loss and it's just bad news bears. So number one in our quest of being five for five is to not smoke stuff. Now, notice that I said, don't smoke stuff. So what's that mean? Well, there's more than one thing you might smoke. So typically when you say smoking, you think about tobacco and I don't want you to smoke tobacco, but I also want to extend my comment to cannabis. Many of you know that I'm a very proud medical marijuana recommender and I have found awesome uses for medical marijuana with symptoms uh, in our patients. Uh, some of you on this line might be benefiting from it in some way, but I don't want you to roll up a joint and light it on fire and then suck in the smoke because that's extremely pro-inflammatory to your lungs. And so I don't recommend that. So, so don't smoke stuff, that's number one. Uh, and so number two in our goal of being five for five in our fight against MS is to supplement low levels of vitamin D. Now, many of you on the line are folks that live in sunny Columbus, Ohio. And I say that tongue in cheek because for five to seven months out of the year, there's not a lot of sun. And if you check vitamin D OH25 levels, which I do in all of our patients, it's shocking sometimes they're very, very low. And the best way to get vitamin D is to spend about 15 minutes outside, right? So there's good research actually that 15 minutes outside with your shirt off is the equivalent of taking like 5,000 international units of vitamin D3. And so that's a, like probably the best way to get sun. Not for very long, I'm not saying go out in bronze, but even just going out uh, with skin exposed uh, for 15 minutes can really boost your level. And there's another way to do that because not everybody is able to go out and, and be, you know, a time in the sun. And most commonly what we recommend is that we take a pill. And so there's lots of different ways to take D3. Uh, there's over the counter pills. And if we check your level and find that you're low, then we may give you more than 5,000. Some people take higher than that each day. Uh, and commonly I'll give people 50,000 weekly. It's one pill a week for uh, once a week for many, many weeks, and that boosts your level up. So we can check your level and we wanna make sure it doesn't go above 100, but we definitely want it above 50. So if you're currently not on vitamin D, or if you don't know your vitamin D level, like we haven't done it in a while, make sure that you bring that up. Now, in reality, we can take this concept of uh, number two, vitamin D, and we can expand it to include diet in general. More and more, I think diet really, really matters. And I don't think that diet necessarily slows MS per se, but it sure as heck can improve symptoms in a big way. I can tell you success story after success story of people that have adhered to a quality diet. They lose weight, they walk more easily, they fall less often, they have better sex, they sleep better, they exercise better, their thinking and memory improves and their mood improves. So when thinking about the right kind of diet, it can get really overwhelming. And there's all these different diets. Now let's talk about the elements of diet that I think are important because it's not very highfalutin. We can kind of do this pretty straightforwardly. So for starters is and beyond vitamin D is water. And you would fare very, very well by opting your water. All right. So let's do a little MS water challenge right now. Come on, I drink and you drink. And I want you to up your water game. If you take vitamin D and you up your water game, you're gonna find that you start to feel better. You're gonna have more energy. You're gonna be less spastic. You're gonna be less um, fatigued. It's really, really kind of good stuff. It also help you with your bowel and bladder quite a bit. 
So how do we up our water game? You drink a glass of water. Now it doesn't need to be a glass this size, but that you drink a glass of water with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that's three glasses. Then all we need to do is we need to stick in um, a glass of water between breakfast and lunch. And then we need to stick in a glass of water between lunch and dinner. And if you do that, that's five glasses of water and you are well on your way. The other advantage to doing it that way is you're going to enter the evening time not dehydrated. You're not going to be, you know, really, really thirsty and then pounding water before bedtime and then getting up all night to pee. So upping your water game is really a good idea. Now, the next thing that I want you to think about is eating real food. And this is really hard to do. So uh, that's not real food. That's actually like fake food. Uh, if you leave out a cheeseburger for a couple of years, it looks like a cheeseburger. Why? Because it's not really a cheeseburger. It's a bunch of chemicals because real food should rot. If you leave real food out, it should spoil and go bad. And I challenge you to eat real food. So avoid foods that have chemicals and ingredients that you can't pronounce. So if you look at the ingredients and you can't pronounce those words, then I don't want you eating those things. I want you to eat foods that have ingredients like chicken, fish, broccoli, asparagus, lettuce, beets, things like that. Uh, things that you can pronounce and things where it's not very, it's real food. I want you to avoid fast food and soda pop. I want you to avoid heavily processed foods. Um, I want you to avoid sugar laden foods and fried foods. So if you supplement vitamin D, if you up your water game and simply pick real food and not fake food, you are doing better than I would say 90% of uh, red blooded Americans. Um, in, in, in that's, that's a big, big opportunity for change and improvement in the setting of MS in a really big way. I can't tell you how many times in my career I've asked patients to do what I just said, and then one of them will do it and they come back and they're like, wow. And it's really exciting for me when they can see the value in that. So, so number two in being five for five is to supplement vitamin D. And if we want to expand that concept a little bit, then we would add in addition to that, the diet stuff that I just mentioned. Now we get into number three, which is exercise. So exercise is a disease modifying therapy. I just shared a little bit ago that when you exercise, you increase BDNF. And the same thing happens when you take some of the MS medicines. Exercise slows brain volume loss and exercise improves sleep. And, and exercise is super, super important. Is let's take a hypothetical that we clone you. All right, so now there's two of you. We're gonna have to get written permission from your spouse. Um, it's gonna be very complicated, but we'll have two of you. And we're gonna give one of you days of our lives, television, daytime TV and chocolate cake. And the other one, we're going to give an elliptical and carrots. And then we'll do that for a couple of years and we'll get back together. Now, the first clone has gained some weight. They have a weak core, cardiovascular, they're not doing great. Their balance is not awesome. Flexibility is not awesome, but they're an aficionado of chocolate cake and they know everything about daytime TV that you could ever want. Now, the other person is a Greek god or Greek goddess, and they've lost some pounds, and they have a strong core, and they have excellent cardiovascular fitness, their balance is better, all these things. And then they both suffer an attack of left leg weakness. Now, the first person is in a wheelchair looking up. The second person is limping going to work. And I'm not going to insult anybody on this call right now and ask you which one do you want to be. It's a rhetorical question. But it's a really, really important point because we can buttress against an attack uh, by exercising ahead of time. And I need you to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Now, I, I chose that sentence very carefully. Doing something as part of your lifestyle is, is like the way I brush my teeth. So I have a lifestyle where I brush my teeth. I do it in the morning. I do it in the evening. I don't brag about it. I don't call my friends. I don't tweet out on Twitter. I brushed my teeth today. It's just something that I do. And... If I forgot to brush my teeth, when I realized that I had muck mouth, then I would just go brush them. I wouldn't call and apologize or punish myself. No, no, I would just go brush my teeth. It's part of my lifestyle. I want you to have exercise as part of your lifestyle. I want you to find an activity that you don't hate. And I want you to do it routinely. Once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Honestly, I just want you to do an activity on a regular basis. And if you say, well, Aaron, which activity? The answer is whatever you don't hate. And actually I've had a couple of patients that during the pandemic purchased equipment, either used or new, 
a rowing machine or a recumbent bike or a bicycle or a treadmill or a elliptical. These are all devices that you can uh, bring home. Some of them you can buy used for relatively inexpensive. You can certainly find these things at gyms. I want you to find an activity that you don't think is stinky. And if you tell me, well, Aaron, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to exercise. I respect that. And it may require some assistance to figure out a good way for you to exercise. I'll give you a couple examples. The water is magical. Like seriously, exercising in the water is the jam. And the reason is multiple. When you're in the water, you weigh less. So if you have a weak leg, that makes it really hard to support your weight. In the water, you weigh less. And if you get overheated, the water pulls the heat off your body. If you fall one way, the water pushes back the other way. Spasticity is less of a concern in the water. So you can get a lot done in the water that you can't get done on land. Now there are options to do water Zumba classes, water aerobics. You could go swimming actually, but I am totally down with you getting in the pool and, do, and walking laps. You can walk laps in the pool. It's a fantastic way to get steps in. If there's a concern for safety, you throw a life jacket on, walk on the, with a life jacket on. Now, if you're struggling to figure out a type of exercise, that is a great conversation for us to have. And the key elements that are important in MS are four, right? The first one is cardiovascular endurance. The second one is core strengthening. The third is flexibility. And the fourth is balance. So we've talked about vitamin D and diet. We've talked about smoking or how I don't want you to. And we've talked about exercise. And that's three of the five. Now, the fourth one is to take a disease modifying therapy and make sure it's working. And many of you know, I want you on the most effective disease modifying therapy that you're comfortable with because you have to be comfortable with it. So I chose that sentence very carefully. I want to put you on the single most effective drug that's available to you that you're comfortable taking. Now, for some people, that might be a so-called low efficacy drug because that's what they're comfortable with. Okay, but whatever drug you're on, it's not a one and done. Now we have to monitor to see how you're doing. Now, how do we monitor you? There's really three ways. The first way is the most important way. And that's stuff you tell me because you're a you expert. You know all about you. And if I simply listen to what you say, you're gonna teach me most of what I need to know. Mm -hmm. Now, we take that a step further uh, in clinic. We've, we've been using patient reported outcome measures. So those are those surveys that I ask you to do where you fill in questions about mood and you fill in questions about energy levels and pain and a bunch of other stuff. Those are super, super important. The second thing, or the second most important thing is a toss up between the testing, the MS Olympics and the MRI. And so once a year, up until the age of 60, I want to get an MRI of your brain. And every couple of years, I'm going to get an MRI of your cervical spine. After 60, depending on your disease, we can back off a little bit, maybe do it every other year. And those MRIs are really, really important. Uh, and I typically like to spend the good portion of the visit going through those MRIs with you. Now, it kills me when I meet patients that have had MS for a long time and they've never seen their scans. And to me, that's not okay. I want you to see your MRIs. I want you to ask questions about your MRIs. I've actually made some YouTube videos where I, I hid the person and I just read their MRI on YouTube. And so I could kind of share with folks like how I do that. Now, the MS Olympics, this is the nine hole peg test that we do in the clinic and the symbol digit modality, the matching test and the walking test for folks that are ambulatory. And, and I think that those are very, very powerful measures. So we're going to have you on a disease modifying therapy, the most effective therapy that you're comfortable with. And then we're going to monitor how we're doing based on your experience, what you tell us, are you passing the litmus test of life? Are you having attacks? What's the deal? What do we see on the MRI and what do we see on the testing? And so that's how we're going to do number four, which is take a medicine and make sure it's working. Now that is my four for four. So I've been talking about being four for four in MS for a long time now. And the other day, well, maybe like a year ago, so I guess it wasn't just the other day, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is a really amazing psychologist. She's up at the Cleveland Clinic, the Mellon Center, and she runs their behavioral health. And she is a dynamo as it relates to mental health and MS, probably the best in the country. Um, she's really super. Her name is Dr. Sullivan. Uh, you can find her on Twitter. And I was talking to her about being four for four. And she said, Boster, it's five for five. 
And I said, well, no, it's not. It's four for four. And she said, no, no, it needs to be five for five. You forgot one. I said, well, which one did I forget? Mindfulness. What you say? Mindfulness. MS, it's worsened by stress, which is a bummer because life is stressful. And I hate it when doctors say, well, well honey, just remove the stress as if you could cut it out. In our Western culture does not facilitate meditation or mindfulness. And so I want to talk about what the heck mindfulness is. Very often we spend a good portion of our time we spend a good portion of our time worrying about the future, thinking about what might happen. Um, I have a friend that calls that telling yourself movies in your mind about if this, then that, what if, what if. I do that all the time. I spend a lot of time thinking about stuff for the future. And we spend a lot of time revisiting the past and reviewing the past and thinking about the past. And this is such a pervasive thing. You might be eating a meal, except you're not really paying attention to the meal. You're responding to work on your phone and you're uh, watching television while you happen to be putting food in your face. You are not living in the present moment. And what I have found is in my own life, when I slow myself down and when I live in the moment, I feel better, I'm less stressed. And when I re-engage in life, even after just a little bit I do a lot better. And so I want to share with you a couple opportunities where you can integrate mindfulness into your life. And there are awesome books written about this. There's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, meditation is an awesome way to do it. But I'm just going to share with you some real world things that I actually do that, that help. So the first one is I like to practice breathing or I like to practice focusing on the now when I take a shower. Right. So wake up in the morning, I like to take a shower. And I'll spend an extra couple minutes and you're going to think I'm a weirdo, but sometimes I sit down in the shower, like cross-legged and close my eyes and breathe. And I try not to think about my work day or what happened last night. I really try to focus on just breathing. I really try to focus on the, the, the feeling of the water hitting me, the temperature of the water, the way it feels on my skin. And, and it's better than just a normal shower. When I get out of the shower, I feel refreshed, not just because I've cleaned off, but because I've done this uh, relaxation process. So that's something that you might try out because you're already in the shower. Another one that I think is really, really useful is what, what some people call mindful meals or mindful eating. And so uh, what I was sharing earlier, when you're eating food and responding to an email and watching television, you know, you're, you're doing a million things. You're not in the present moment. You're all spread out all over the place. So here's a challenge. The next time you have a meal, and ideally the next time you have a meal with some people, but the next time you have a meal, try doing it in a, a fashion where you really focus on what you're doing. So turn off all the screens. I would turn off the radio. I mean, we don't want external input. And don't eat standing up while walking. Sit down at the table, set a plate, like, prepare a meal. And I want you to sit down and I want you to look at what you're eating, like pay it, look, look at it, think about what it looks like, smell it, consciously smell the food. And I want you to spend some time focusing on tasting what you're eating. What you'll find is that you'll be in the moment and there's a sense of peace in doing that. Now you can expand it to include your family. Take a look at the folks that are around you. For a moment, practice gratitude and think about how freaking awesome it is that you get to be with your family right now and how cool it is that you all get to share a meal together. And you might even take it a step further and talk about how you're doing that day. What was the high of your day? What was the low of your day? Engage with the people that you're with. So that's the concept of mindful meals or mindful eating. And I think that to live our very best life with multiple sclerosis, we need to be five for five. Yes, we need to take a DMT and make sure it's working. Yes, I don't want you smoking stuff. And yes, I want you to be exercising as part of your lifestyle. And yes, we need to make sure that we're supplementing vitamin D. But number five is not to be underappreciated. And number five is to take a moment each day, one moment each day to practice mindfulness or meditation. It's a centering process and it helps us handle stress much, much better.